controlled vocabulary in practice. And uh, for those of you who have been attending the previous two sessions, this should be kind of bringing it all together again, kind of uh, going away from the technical parts that we've been talking about uh, two weeks ago, where we got really into the encoding within EAD and ECCPF, uh, to how controlled vocabularies, authority files can be used uh, into examples. And I'm glad that we are moving away a little bit from the European um, dominance that we had during the last two sessions and actually can welcome two colleagues from Asia and from Oceania. Uh, so I've got with me today Kirsten Wright, who's the program manager um, at the Find and Connect web resource um, at the University of Melbourne, and Li Yanlin, who's the special collections librarian and archivist at the Fudan University Library. So welcome Kirsten and Yanlin. And welcome everyone to this session today. Just to, to start off, off um, a quick reminder. So we actually have run this webinar series in two sets for two time zones. So this is the one for Europe to Oceania through, so to say. Um, there's another session uh, which will mainly be concentrating on decolonization of metadata and archival descriptions, um, which is this afternoon European time, uh, so might be getting a little bit late to for all our colleagues in towards the east, um, but uh, this is mainly aimed at the Americas, but if you have time, if you're interested, please feel free to join that session as well. Uh, we started out with a general overview of um, what vocabularies are, what controlled vocabularies are, why it could be useful to implement them. Um, then, as I mentioned last time, we spoke about how to encode controlled this term in archival description. And today we're going to see two very different um, examples from the practice. And with this, I'm going to get take over for ask Kirsten to take over or res respectively um, come to the floor and present us the find and connect resource. Thank you very, very much. And yeah, thanks for having me today. And it's great to be here and be part of these discussions. Um, so yeah, I'm coming to you today from the unceded and stolen lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nations, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. So yeah, I'm here to talk about issues of language and description for the project that I manage, um, which is called the Find and Connect web resource. Um, I am talking about issues of um, historical language um, now considered offensive today, and I'm deliberately not including any examples of this in the talk, and I hope the reasons for doing so are obvious. Um, so the Find and Connect web resource is a team, uh, or there's five of us, uh, including archivists, historians, and communication specialists. We are based in the Faculty of Arts at the University of Melbourne. And we are funded by the Australian government as part of the government's broader Find and Connect program, a response to Australia's child welfare system of the 20th century. So we run the website portion of the Find and Connect, uh, the sort of overall umbrella program. And then the government also uh, funds various support organisations uh, to provide a range of services for people who grew up in out of home care. So the Find and Connect website pr provides key information about child welfare in Australia. We try to have every child welfare institution that's existed in Australia going back to 1795, including the dates of operation, where it was, who ran it, together with the broader context of child welfare in Australia over time. So when I'm talking about child welfare institutions, I mean places like orphanages, children's homes, missions, farm schools, disability institutions, and, and the list goes on. And our primary users are people who grew up in out-of-home care, so the people who grew up in these, these institutions, and the support organisations assisting these people. Um, can you change the, the slide, please? So this is what the front page of the website looks like currently, if you haven't seen it before. And Find and Connect is also an important knowledge base for advocates, lawyers, and organisations who provide this support, helping people who grew up in care to trace family and also to seek justice for abuse. 
And because of this work, we have a large emphasis on the records of out of home care. Um, so for people who grew up in care, who in Australia identify as care leavers, forgotten Australians, former child migrants and members of the solar generations, they are reliant on these institutional records to find out information about their childhoods. Uh, next slide, please. So many of the records that are considered fairly routine childhood records for most people, things like birth certificates, information about family members, medical and health information, school information. For people who grew up in out of home care, these records are only available in the form of institutional records they need to request to access. And the quotes on, these, on this slide are from some people who grew up in care, reflecting on the importance of these records to them. And it's also important to note the central role that records and archives play in achieving historical justice. Their use in seeking recognition of people's experiences in care, including being able to participate in schemes such as the National Redress Scheme established in Australia. And so these records are held by a vast variety of organisations, including government archives, church and charitable organisations, university archives, past providers of care and other cultural institutions. And so Finding Connect acts basically as a giant catalogue or finding aid to these records, describing what they are, who holds them and how to get access to them. So just to be clear, we don't hold any records ourselves. We're not a sort of collecting archive in that sense. Instead, we provide information about what exists and, and how to get access to it. Um, next slide, thank you. Um, just if you haven't seen the site before, this is just an example of what about an entry about an institution looks like. Um, so on the live site, you can click on those tabs across the top and, and see some photos and, and look at what the records are, um, see who ran it, um, see where it was, and, and then obviously a description of the institution. Um, and if you go to the next slide, um, this shows you how the records are listed. Um, and so, again, on the live site, each of these listings you can click on and get a description of the records. And these descriptions are really written with people who grew up in out-of-home care in mind. So they don't necessarily just replicate what um, the collecting archive or the, the holding institution might have in their catalogues, for example. Um, we will, you know, highlight things that we, are, we know are of most important to care leaders. Um, yeah, sort of... Uh, yeah, provide extra information where we can about what's included and also what's not included. And this is about, you know, making it clear what people can access, but also, I guess, um, managing those expectations about what they might find in the records whenever we can. Um, so this example, you can see that there's three or four different uh, collections of records about this, um, this institution, Tallyho's Boys Training Farm. They're all held by different organisations and they're all quite, you know, separate um, collections. Um, and in this case, there's records held by the past provider with the Uniting Church. Um, there's materials at the state archives and also materials at the university archives. So yeah, this is sort of what Finding Connect does. It kind of brings all these disparate uh, but related collections and, and materials together so that people who are in particular institutions can, can see what's available. Um, do you wanna to go to the next slide, please? So we create entries such as organisations, events, publications, legislation, photographs, and then obviously the archival collections and material by drawing on a, the wide range of available information and resources. And importantly, we can assign and describe relationships between all of these different entities, creating an accessible contextual framework to represent and interpret the complex and disparate information about child welfare in the public domain. And to note as well, we do only have material from the public domain. Some people think that we might have an additional sort of confidential database with individuals information in it. We don't. It's more about providing that broader context and that broader um, yeah, information about child welfare in Australia. Um, so we continue to update all aspects of the site as circumstances change and as new information comes to light. Um, we actually first went live in 2011 and I'm still amazed today. There are still new institutions being added and certainly a lot of records information being added. And it's also possible to export and share our data in XML form and in line with um, archival standards such as EACCPF. Um, do you wanna to go to the next slide? Thank you. So official accounts such as annual reports, commissioned histories and newspaper articles are really important sources for us. But equally important are the accounts from people, the children who were there. 
found in oral history interviews, um, submissions to inquiries and memoirs. And sometimes people get in touch with us directly wanting to share their experiences. Um, do you want to go to the next slide if you can? Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, so we try to have a mix of these, I guess, like official, official sources um, and testimony, not to necessarily balance the um, entries, not to necessarily create some overarching narrative, as much to present these differing accounts side by side. And sometimes these voices contradict each other, and that's okay. Um, so Shirley Swain, um, there's a quote here on the slide from her. She's written about Find and Connect having a contrapuntal approach and presenting a multitude of narrative threads while acknowledging they may never be reconciled. So as you can probably tell, Find and Connect, the work we do on Find and Connect puts us at a really interesting space with language. And careful consideration has always gone into the way that institutions such as orphanages are described and the records information I mentioned um, yeah, often differs, as I said, from, from the sort of official listings or, or how materials being catalogued. But Finding Connect has also always included a lot of photographs, primarily of homes um, and institutions, sometimes of people as well. And in entering these, we had generally fallen back on reproducing the descriptions of photographs found in those archival collections that they were from, kind of in line with, with those archival descriptive standards. And this caused some issues. Um, can you go to the next slide, thank you. So because of the nature of the work on Find and Connect, we get an interesting cross-section of historical language in relation to photographs and, and archival material as well. So because of the Australian government's policy regarding the forcible removal of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children away from family and culture and into missions and homes, we have materials relating to First Nations peoples and the words used to describe them and justifying these policies of removal. And we also have homes and facilities used to house children with disabilities and mental illness. And then the general societal judgments placed on unwed mothers, uh, poor people with the uh, sort of inherent implications regarding the deserving and undeserving poor, and children through who no fault of their own became entangled within the child welfare system. So there's a few issues in reproducing this original language. The first is, of course, that the language used to describe these groups I've mentioned is outdated and offensive in many cases. And we've heard from a variety of care leavers about the offence and distress that this language can cause. Um, Jackie Wilson and Frank Golding, who are two care leaver academics, have called the records relating to their time in care as weapons of affect and sort of talk about how the language of these, these records and the language used to describe them followed them through the welfare system far more persistently than their actions did. And secondly, because of how material is presented on Find and Connect, it was not clear that these titles of photographs in particular weren't added by us, weren't added by the staff. And we certainly received emails from people who were angry and insulted that it seemed like Find and Connect was using this like really offensive language. And third, on a really just pragmatic level, the use of historical language might mean that people can't find what they're searching for because these aren't terms that they'll necessarily be searching for today. This is not the vocabulary they'll use to search. And this is, um, you know, sort of being discussed in a number of ways, um, both that it's not appropriate for people to use slurs to search for family members, their, their own materials, community members, but also it means that important information can't be found. And Finding Connect exists in an interesting space and distance in relation to the material that we list. So as I said, we don't hold any of these records ourselves. We're not responsible and we have no control over how the archival material is catalogued, digitized and made available by the organizations that do hold it. But for many people, Finding Connect is the first time they've looked for material about their time in care. Again, we're, we're primarily dealing with people looking for information about themselves or their family members. And Finding Connect is usually the top result in Google. If someone Googles the name of an institution in Australia, Finding Connect often comes up first. And so it might not be immediately apparent to somebody visiting the site for the first time, especially coming through a Google search, maybe to an institution, an entry about an institution, that the site is meant to be archival or that it is based on archival descriptive principles. And I suggest that doing a Google search and sort of coming across Finding Connect in that way is a different experience for most people than, say, doing a search and ending up on 
a state or national archive site where it's immediately obvious you're looking at catalog entries, you know, you're looking at, um, yeah, sort of, it's obvious you're at an archives, whereas at Finding Connect, it's not necessarily as obvious. And so while we don't have responsibility for how other organisations catalog their archival material, we do have a responsibility about how that material is described, used and interacted with on our side. So in 2017, we determined that the way we would title archival material and use historical language would change. And we thought we'd start by writing a policy about it and sort of setting out our position. And it was quite interesting because we, we looked around for other similar policies at a starting point. And at least at that time in 2017, we discovered that although we knew anecdotally other organisations were doing this, no one was explicitly talking about it. No one was talking about, certainly in Australia, no one was saying we're renaming material or we're, we're recataloguing this material or had published a statement about it. And this has obviously changed over time and there's, you know, a lot more information and commentary about what's what's become known as reparative archival description. I, for, for me, I found that most of this material is coming out of, say, the US and Canada. Again, we're not seeing a lot of that necessarily coming out of Australia, um, even though, again, we know people are, are doing this work. So I think that's kind of interesting. Um, so we wrote a policy, and our policy highlights that much of the language historically used to describe people who were in care is considered offensive, derogatory, and inappropriate today. But we certainly do not want to censor or sugarcoat the history of care. It was awful for a lot of people, and it was based on policies and practices that were, and I quote from the policy, based on racist ideologies, moralistic ideas about women, children, and families, and eugenicist views of people with disabilities or mental illness. So in the policy, it recognises the importance of keeping the original titles available for a couple of reasons. First is that the title or caption forms part of that key identity information for that object. And that title is necessary, particularly for us to make sure that people can go back to those, um, those institutions, those archival descriptions, those catalogues where the records are held and access that material if they need to. And secondly, it is important to demonstrate the language and thus the policy or underlying opinions of the time. Can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. And so the outcome was that the full original titles, as well as other identifying material like call numbers, were moved into a field called archival reference. So the full titles are still there, but within a field that better contextualizes this information as part of the information you need to retrieve or verify an item. So this shows an example, um, a really, really basic example of where um, the only title, uh, this is a, an image from the Australian War Memorial, the only title the War Memorial provides is actually their ID number. Um, and so we've gone ahead and added a title based on the description that yeah, was in the War Memorial catalogue and then um, added that ID number in the archival reference field. So you can imagine this working the same way when we are talking about those issues of uh, offensive language as well. Um, I will as note as well, um, when we were doing this work, we did uh, begin to question how original some of these apparently original titles were. And many had clearly been added by the archivist or cataloger at some point during the description process, rather than you know, this title having been uh, sort of attached to the record from its initial creation. So that was just an interesting consideration as well. Um, can you change the slide, please? So something we're not changing is when uh, that now offensive language has been used in the names of homes or institutions on the site. Um, this is how these places were known, and again, is how people will be searching for them in this case. And so to provide further context around this, as well as the policy statement, we have for some time had a content warning, which is available via a link on any page. Um, and this content warning jet talks generally about um, content on the site potentially being confronting or disturbing for people, but we've also added a section specifically about language and how and why original language is being reproduced. What I do want to make clear is that while I believe archivists should be making deliberate and conscious choices about our descriptions, our metadata and descriptive standards, I strongly believe it's not our place to redact or otherwise limit access to the records um, because of concerns for historical viewpoints. And certainly here in Australia, we've seen some quite shocking examples. Um, there was a registry of births, deaths and marriages here in Australia that was redacting any references to someone being Aboriginal when providing birth certificates. Um, which, you know, obviously was highly inappropriate. And I think instead we, we need to remember what we can do is provide context 
through our description and other explanatory material that fleshes out these records and makes it clearer the historical and policy context in which these words were used. And we can prepare people to see upsetting and distressing information and do that in a supported and supportive way without affecting the records themselves. Next slide, thank you. Um, so the policy went live in 2017 um, and we did receive a variety of responses to it at the time. Um, we had some people in 2017 who were outraged that we would dare pander to, you know, left-wing social justice, political correctness, and how dare we ever change a word. I will note that uh, when we announced this policy in Australia, it was at the same time there was a lot of public discussion around the inscription of uh, on statues of colonisers in Australia. And there was a particular statue of Captain Cook in Sydney that was sort of the focus of a lot of these discussions. And some of the feedback we got was in line with those uh, discussions around statues and public monuments. Um, we got other feedback that basically said we didn't go far enough and we should have, you know, strike throughs of those words and commentaries about why these words should no longer be used and the impact they may have on people. And so since this initial work that we did in 2017, 2018, we've seen discussions on, and issues of reparative archival description really being taken up by a lot of archivists. And there's a lot more information out there. There's, you know, working groups have been formed and there's a lot of resources now around um, how to undertake a reparative description program if you're keen to do so. And also, you know, things like warnings around historical language have become far more commonplace on, on archives, websites and catalogues than I think they were even sort of five, six years ago. So for us on Finding Connect, um, if anything, our practice has strengthened since that initial policy. And we're a lot clearer now about the changes we're willing to make and sort of being more explicit about our own uh, positionalities and interventions, I guess. And so this includes more explicit referencing in entries about where all of our information is coming from and being yet yeah, more willing to provide commentary on attitudes and, and the records of the past. Um, our policy, though, hasn't had a review since it was originally developed in 2017, and so we are a little overdue for a review, and so we're hoping this will happen this year. And we're also considering if we need um, more contextual information about the records, for example, in that language and content warning page, do we need a discussion around the implicit bias of child welfare records, for example, or do we need to be more explicit about how and why we reference sources? And it's these kinds of things that I think will we'll, uh, sort of uh, inform the reviewing and the rewriting of the policy. So in closing, I'd like to ask us all to consider our archival practices and processes as critical interventions, as deliberate and conscious acts, rather than passively doing a thing because it's the way it's always been done. Or in Terry Cook and Joan Schwartz's words, because of, quote, the social magic of now unquestioned naturalised norms. So what we did on Finding Connect might not suit your context or, or be appropriate for the records you're working with, but hopefully it will be a bit of a starting point in considering your own descriptive work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kirsten. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing briefly uh, to see if there are any direct questions uh, to Kirsten's um, presentation before we go into the second one. Uh, I don't think we've had anything from the chat. And I don't think anyone is currently raising their hand. So we'll just kind of move on to Jan Lin's presentation, uh, which has been pre recorded. Um, so we're going to watch this and then let's see how the next steps go. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, everyone. My name is Li Yanling, but you can call me Ellen to make things easier for everyone. I work as a librarian in the Special Collections Department of Fudan University Library. My daily responsibilities include preservation and cataloging, as well as managing the reading room and educating readers. Yes, it is a small department. This presentation is pre-recorded, so I can take the advantage of this not being in person and better interact with you in chat. I recently can finally announced that I completed a project that involved collecting and cataloging the memory of the Fudan community on the topic of COVID-19. 
This collection consisted mainly of born digital materials, as you can assume, since this global tragedy has affected every individual in our society. The amount of participations and the complexity of the discussions made it difficult task to organize and analyze the data. That's why I'm here today to share this case with you and hopefully gain some insights and ideas from your perspectives. Born digital materials are digital content that is created and exists only in digital form, as opposed to physical objects that has been digitized. These materials include a wide range of digital content such as websites, social media posts, emails, videos, and photos. We professional librarians are responsible for collecting, organizing, and preserving born digital materials for future generations. We must also ensure that these materials are accessible and usable in the long term, which requires knowledge of digital preservation best practices and the ability to stay current with evolving technology. As digital content continues to grow in importance, librarians play a critical role in ensuring the born digital materials are collected and preserved effectively. Preserving born digital materials during the pandemic is crucial as much of people's communication and creative expressions has shifted to the digital realm with the widespread use of computers and smartphones. This includes emails, social media posts, videos, and other forms of digital content that document how individuals and organizations have responded to the pandemic. Plus, the quarantine and lockdown policies speeded up paperless process of both government and corporations. Without preserving these materials, we risk losing invaluable information about how people experienced and coped with the epidemic, as well as important insights into how society adapted to a rapidly changing environment. Moreover, Born digital materials offer significant opportunities for future research and analysis, providing a wealth of information for scholars and historians seeking to comprehend this period of history. Therefore, librarians play a pivotal role in preserving and organizing born digital materials for future generations. We must keep up with the evolving technology and process knowledge of digital preservation best practices to ensure that these materials are accessible and usable in the long term. At the onset of the pandemic, people were celebrating the Spring Festival without any idea that they would not be allowed to return to campus. Teams of medical professionals went to Wuhan, the front line, and student organizations across the country organized volunteers to help those in need. Scholars also provided objective opinions to calm the public's nerves. As the university library, we felt a sense of duty to preserve this unique memory and ensure the entire food and community's contribution to the fight against the virus was recorded. We started collecting and cataloging every material we could reach right away. Collecting and preserving born digital materials during the pandemic presents a range of challenges beyond content organization, including access. Access to born digital materials can be limited by factors such as internet connectivity, device availability, and language barriers. Social media platforms or website owners may also have policies in place to limit data scraping and downloading, restricting access to certain materials. Privacy concerns. Collecting and preserving born digital materials can raise concerns about privacy, particularly with personal information shared on social media. Collectors must ensure that they are collecting information ethically and legally, and that they are protecting the privacy of individuals whose data they are collecting. Technical difficulties. 
Collecting and preserving born digital materials often requires specialized technology expertise, which may be lacking in some organizations or individuals. Technical difficulties can arise when trying to collect the data from social media platforms, particularly when the data is unstructured and lacks consistent metadata. This brings us to the complexity of social media platforms. Many social media platforms have complex privacy settings, which can make it difficult to access and collect data from users. In addition, social media platforms are constantly evolving, which means that collectors must stay up to date with changes in platforms' functionality and data collection policies. Preservation challenges. Preservation challenges. Born digital materials present unique challenges when it comes to preservation. Digital media can degrade over time, and new technologies can quickly make old formats obsolete. Collectors must ensure that the materials are stored in a way that will allow them to be accessed and used in the future, even as technologies evolve. In addition to these challenges, authority control can also be particularly difficult for East Asian names due to multiple factors. Factor one: multiple names. Individuals in many East Asian countries may have multiple names, including given names, surnames, and nicknames. The order of these names can also vary depending on the culture and language. Making it difficult to establish a standardized naming convention for authority control. Factor two, romanization. Romanization of Eastern Asian names can pose challenges due to the different systems of romanization that may exist for the same language, leading to inconsistencies in spelling and pronunciations. Historical variations. Historical variations in spelling and naming conventions can also make authority control difficult, as political and social changes over the time result in changes of language and naming practices. Large volume of names. East Asian countries have large populations, and their naming conventions can be complex. Resulting in a large volume of names to manage, making authority control a time-consuming and challenging process. The most problematic factor for this project: same names. The occurrence of multiple individuals with the same name is another challenge in authority control for East Asian names. Due to the large population and complex naming conventions, making it difficult to distinguish between individuals in authority control systems. Fudan University is a highly esteemed research institution situated in Shanghai, China. Established in 1905, it holds a distinguished position as one of the oldest and most selective universities in the country, consistently earning a place among the top universities in national rankings. As a complex organization, Fudan University comprises numerous schools and faculties, including the School of Economics, the Law School, the School of International Relations and Public Affairs. And the School of Journalism. It also houses multiple research institutes and centers specializing in various fields, such as biomedicine, materials science, and humanities. Apart from its academic offerings, Fudan University runs several affiliated hospitals, including the Shanghai Cancer Center and the Huashan Hospital. These hospitals enjoy a prominent reputation for their cutting-edge medical technology and exceptional patient care, and they play a pivotal role in both research and clinical practice. Fudan University provides a diverse area of student organizations catering to various interests and habits. These organizations are a vital part of campus life. 
offering students opportunities to participate in extracurricular activities, expand their social circles, and develop skills beyond the classroom. Many of them are not registered, for it does not seem necessary. For those keen on pursuing academic interests, Fudan University features several academic organizations, such as Fudan Law Society, the Fudan Economics Association, and the Fudan Debate Team. These organizations facilitate intellectual engagement and provide students with a platform to engage in academic discussions with like-minded peers. These clubs are often run by faculties, or even the school, sometimes across schools. Fudan University also houses several volunteer and social organizations, such as the Fudan Volunteer Association and the Fudan Student Union, providing opportunities for students to engage in community service and contribute positively to society. These organizations can be cooperating with organizations out of the university. Being a prestigious university in China, Fudan has a robust social media presence on various platforms, including WeChat, Weibo, and Douyin, among others. Each school, department, or student organization may have its social media accounts to promote their activities and engage with followers. While the number of social media accounts officially affiliated with Fudan University is already huge, it is a more significant number with the ones that are not registered. Moreover, the university has a student population of over 35,000 including undergraduates and graduates, and a faculty and staff population over 5,000. The alumni community is also a crucial part of the university. As a result, in this project, we made a decision to write a web cover to have us all publicly published articles containing the keyword Fudan and E, meaning epidemic instead of collecting posts by accounts. Managing the overwhelmingly large volume of posts we received was challenging, especially since we were working remotely with limited access to analysis tools and confidential documents. Cataloging the posts poses an even greater challenge, particularly when it comes to recording the identities of agents. One of the biggest upscales we faced was dealing with East Asian names. As mentioned before, they can be difficult to control. However, the intelligence department of the library had recently developed a system called Routes, which contained authority files for all Fudan faculty members. Although the system was originally designed to track faculty publications for bonus calculations, it proved useful for analyzing the posts as it provided a clear model of the complicated food and university structure, including faculty names and titles. Despite this, we encountered difficulties when it comes to identifying and verifying student and alumni authors. They can be active on multiple platforms using various identities, such as official school accounts, clubs, companies, and press news, personal posts, and replies. We had to record their identities and relations manually as most analysis tools were ineffective. Luckily, I had over 30 student workers who were not able to perform their very on-site job to help. They were able to confirm the identity of many post authors and unofficial organizations and unregistered clubs as friends. So at some level, it became a crowdsourcing project. However, it was difficult to ask the student workers to master XML language, so we had them using Archivespace instead. Although in version 2.5.2, .2, the agent module was not yet expanded, it was the most remote, friendly, and easy-to-use tool we had. We lost some of the privileges of EACCPF 
but the student workers found it simpler to learn, with an average of just two hours of training required. We also improvised a little to improve efficiency and free the student workers from calculating the hierarchy of the organizations and people. For faculty names controlled by roads, we only needed an ID. We can get information of the person's other names, organization, and other information imported through this road ID later. So the only requirements for the student worker was to check if the person being described by roads is the one he or she was cataloging. Make sure the ID is correct. Make sure source says roads. For other names, we use the qualifier to record their organizations at the time. This saves the time of verifying if the organization name mentioned in the article is the official one, which was hard to do in A space. The difference can be often very subtle, and the software does not support Chinese searching very well. It can be very time consuming for one to find the right one. There is also a risk of the altered name not being cataloged or sorted yet. When my army of student workers was working on person names, I was carefully netting the web of organizations and their accounts, recording and verifying every name ever used in posts we gathered and continue gathering, distinguishing the organization and their social media accounts using the same names. Sorting the relation of student organizations with one or more schools and departments and their children organizations, which oftentimes has their own social media accounts. I found this part of the job cannot be done by AI at the time, even with the model from Rhodes, with all the official organizations' relations clearly and accurately recorded. And I still doubt it can be done by GPT-4 till these days. Also, it should be done by one person only, for the sake of one misunderstanding can make this task twice more difficult. But with my data of the agents later downloaded in the format of EACCPF, it was easily transformed and imported into a linked data application illustrating the great fight happened in Fudan community during this historical period. Here are some lessons I learned. During my experience with crowdsourcing using ASPACE, I discovered that although it can be effective, it is designed for trained archivists. I highly recommend using a system that's especially designed for crowdsourcing. This will not only save time and resources, but also produce better results. When it comes to individual identity, it is important to recognize that some people may not want to be identified or labeled in certain way. It takes courage to accept this and respect their wishes rather than trying to force a label or identity onto them. As we updated our A space, we faced the challenge of reorganizing the data from the collection into standard EACCPF format. It was a daunting task, but necessary. The way this part of the authority file were not appropriate for long term use. There are still a lot of cleaning up to do. For example, many qualifiers has to remain because they have no other options at the time. I hope that in the future, we can avoid similar emergency giant projects. But if they do arise, we are now better equipped to handle them. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted all aspects of society including the way we communicate and express ourselves. Born digital materials have become a primary means of recording and preserving these experiences. As the case study from Fudan University Library highlights, librarians play a critical role in collecting, preserving, and organizing born digital materials. The challenges associated with preserving born digital materials, such as access, privacy concerns, technical difficulties, and preservation challenges 
highlight the need for specialized knowledge and expertise. In particular, authority control for East Asian names presents additional difficulties due to cultural and linguistic factors. However, despite these challenges, preserving born digital materials provides a rich source of data for researchers and historians seeking to understand the impact of pandemic on society, culture, and politics. It also promotes transparency and accountability and ensures that important historical information is not lost due to the ephemeral nature of digital media. Thank you for your time. If I did not answer your question in chat yet, I'll be back later in our question time. Thank you very much. That was the presentation from Yan Lin. Um, thanks again to, to both of our speakers. I think that was a really interesting contradiction, so to say, of uh, a project dealing with historic language uh, and historical documents and the project dealing with very recent documents from a completely different type and kind of both dealing with the aspects of language, um, dealing with the aspects of um, yeah, being just to the persons that are being described. Um, and I just want to open the floor to see if there are any questions for either Kirsten or Jan Lin. Um, before you do that, uh, I will actually stop the recording so people can really feel free to ask the questions they want to ask. Thank you very much, Karen.